All right, welcome to our discussion of utopianism and Judaism. Uh, let's see indeed if the Torah uh, sort of anticipates that ultimately Jews should live in a utopian sort of society or is the Torah more realistic that, uh, you know, things are the way they are and people are, people are always gonna be people and just that's, that's the way it goes and not much we can do about that. So uh, let's take a look, particularly through the lens of this week's Parsha, regarding the Shemitah and the Ovel, the, um, the sabbatical year and the jubilee year. Okay. So, <clears throat> utopianism, Judaism, do they get along uh, or not? Let's take a look. So, as we, we think about the reason for the Shemitah, the sabbatical year in our Parsha, you know, that every seven years the land shall lay fallow, we shouldn't work it. Um, what is the reason for that? And how do the rabbis understand the reason? And the understanding of the reason might explain to us. Um, whether they had a utopian view. So he says, well, Shadal is a modern commentary from the 19th century, so relatively modern. And he said, since the, the, the uh, produce of that year belongs to everybody, it's a, you have mercy on the poor and it equates the rich and the poor and it lowers those who are haughty and rich and reminds them that everybody is equal. And so too, there's another type of Shemitah, sabbatical year, that's not mentioned in this week's Parsha, but it's mentioned in Parsha Kitetse in Devarim, I am sorry, Parsha Re'e in Devarim, that that every seventh year after the sabbatical year is over, all loans are canceled. Also, it's a chamla v'chanin alanim, is a kindness uh, to the poor people. Just uh, just like everyone, aside from, from uh, the festivals of Shabbos, they also have others, other holidays. So too, the sabbatical, the land of Israel, aside from the Shemitah year, which is every Shabbos, it has a special occasion every 50 years. And the Jubilee year also equates the rich and the poor, just like the Shemitah and just like Shabbos. Shabbos also is an equator. Uh, don't forget your slave can't work, so you sort of equate it to the slave. Um, and it, it also has an additional element that the land goes back to its owners and the slaves go free. Uh, it's a tremendous, again, a tremendous uh, mercy on the poor, a strengthening of the equality, equalization of all the people in the country. So in an era in the 19th century where people were having emancipation proclamations and people were having uh, you know, e equal rights, uh, emancipation, um, uh, Jews were getting equal rights. There was a notion that every, all the citizens had equal rights. So he says, that's what the Jubilee year is all about. That's what the sabbatical year is all about. And just like the Jubilee year is one of every seven cycles, so do the holidays are, are, are um, one of seven of the year. Because uh, the, during the year you have 49, um, you have at least 49, uh, Shabbos is. in a Jewish year, there are about 50 uh, weeks, um, 354 divided by seven. Um, and, uh, and then he says, and there are only seven days of holy days. That's the first and the last day of Pesach, it's two. First day, one day of Shavuos, that's three. One day of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, that's five. And then the first and last day of Sukkot is seven. So there are only seven, uh, well, there are only seven holidays, but there are 49 um, Shabbos. So the ratio of, of the Jubilee to Shemitah is similar to Shabbos to the holiday. That's a cute thought. But the main point here is that God is trying to equate the rich and the poor. That's a utopian idea that somehow in the end of, uh, that every now and then, Society equates the rich and the poor. We bring the rich and the poor back in the same plane. It's a utopian value. Rabbi Dovi Hoffman also lived in the 19th century. He was in Germany. That was in Italy. And he says, It teaches us to be modest. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't be so haughty because of our wealth, our, our, our land ownership. Um, don't forget, in the you know, until the modern times, if you land own, own land, you had special privileges. If you didn't, you were landless. 
you are not important. Uh, you don't make any uh, the, 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 the sabbatical year just shows that the land belongs to God. He's in charge of it, um, right? He doesn't allow um, uh, immorality, um, such that if when we, we were neglectful of the Shemitah year, we were exiled. But the Jubilee, so he says, the the sabbatical year is not even, um, but the jubilee year that is to show you that you shouldn't get carried away with your wealth. It's it's an attempt to you know people talk about uh, Democrats trying to uh, you know eradicate the wealth of the of the of, of the rich. Uh, with, you know sometimes when people talk in extreme terms, so there is an effort in the jubilee year to do that. But in the sabbatical year, so it's more about knowing the land belongs to God. One could suggest that's also utopian value, the notion that there isn't fully the idea of private property, that you think you're a big rich guy, you own a lot of property, it's not yours, everybody can, can partake in it. So suddenly you're stripped of your, your wealth. Uh, anybody can go in and eat the fruits in that place. This is Forno, in interpreting what the Jubilee, the sabbatical year is all about, he says, Shabbat Lashem, kol shana the whole year should be ready to worship God. He views the sabbatical year as a time to worship God. It's like it's like a Shabbos every week. Every week we have one day. We can learn. We can daven. We can eat meals in honor of Shabbos and in honor of God. So to the sabbatical year, it's a year uh, to worship God. Nothing else. Sort of also utopian kind of an idea. Sort of like you see many people in the Haredi world today try to live in this utopian world, which we just learn. We don't do anything else. Uh, Torah doesn't necessarily have that value, I wouldn't, I would suggest, but that every seven years, yes, everyone uh, is just dedicated to God, nothing else. Our Shem Shavar Hirsch uh, <coughs> says that uh, he doesn't focus on the, uh, the equation of rich and poor, sort of a communist kind of an idea. Rather, he says uh, it's Shabbos Bereshis, the regular Shabbos we have every week, that's humbling ourselves to God as the creator. And the sabbatical year is to show that uh, he is the owner of the land of Israel. So it's not the utopian kind of a thing. The year of, of Hirsch says, uh, he says the idea is the Jubilee year that the people who, uh, who, who believe that they are the subject, they are the masters of their, of their, of their possessions, and it's not even just something I own. It's uh, my whole personality is the, is this is, I am my possessions. I am what I possess. The Jubilee year tells you no, puts you back in your place and gives you your true honor of your status. And, uh, and that's real freedom. That's what they declare liberty throughout the land, Doror, Gretchen, Doror Bards, liberty throughout the land, as it says in Liberty Bell. What does that mean? So it means to, to say that I am not my property. That's true, Cherut, is that I am no longer what my property is. So again, it's a very, very um, 1960s kind of an idea, very perhaps a leftist idea, but a communist kind of an idea that you know there's no property, there's no rich, rich people, I am not my wealth, et cetera. So there's some element of that. What about the Zevra Chinus? Does he think that there's utopian value here? He says, well, the roots of the commandments were fixed in our hearts to make strong the impression in our minds about the matter of the world having been created. So he thinks that that's what it's about. It's not about some utopian value. Um, he wanted to inform us that everything is his, and the end, everything will turn to those we wanted to give it to first. The earth is his. The commandment of the counseling of 49 years, they will distance themselves from stealing the land of their fellows, not covet the land. So it's to remind you that everything belongs to God. Okay. The Ram has sort of a utopian idea that he mentions within the laws of, of the sabbatical year and the jubilee year, the very oft quoted and uh, very controversial Rambam. Rambam in general is against uh, snoring, he's against living off other people's money. However, he says that not only the Levites, are given special land, but anyone from all the all the world, presumably even a Gentile, who decided to volunteer 
And he was very intelligent to separate himself, to stand before God, to worship him, and to serve him, to know God. And he walked in a straight way, just the way God made him. And he, and he decided to remove from his, from his neck all the yoke of calculations and all kinds of things that people do. Then he becomes holy to God, holy of holies. And God will be his portion and his, his inheritance forever and ever. He will, uh, he will merit in this world. He'll have enough in this world. And so some people say, it's not that he just sits around and he doesn't make a living and he hopes he has enough. God will help him and he'll have enough. Just like the Kohanim, Kohanim Levim, the people give them and there's enough. So too, they will find enough in this world. Not necessarily by someone else giving to them, but they'll find enough in this world. God is my portion. So the Ramah believes that you can opt into this utopian a, a mode if you would like to, if you're really a holy person. Rama himself was a doctor. The Svata met the great Gary Rebbe from around 100 years ago. So he says, God put, the, uh, the idea of the Shemitah is that he gave us a, a connection to a Hanhaga El Yona, to a different way in which the God world functions. You know, you can press two modes when the function, in the, how the world functions. There's a regular mode, and then in that mode, you got to make a living, you got to get a paycheck, you got to pay the bills. There's another mode in which, you know, you don't need anything. On Shabbos, you don't talk about business, you don't know about business, you don't do anything. And um, so on Shabbos and on sabbatical year, this way in which the world functions where, you know, everything, you know, God will provide type of philosophy, reigns supreme, this takes place on not every day of the week, not every day of the week, but on Shabbos and on, on sabbatical year, we plug into this different hanhaga, different way in which God runs the world where somehow you make it even though you don't have enough to make it. The rabbis have the idea, that, that if that a Jew can say, look, I'll borrow money for Shabbos and if it's for Shabbos, somehow I'll get it paid back. So, um, when it comes to even not only Jubilee year, but also Shabbos, Shabbos itself, there's a different plane on which we live, a more utopian kind of a plane. Rob Bog says very clearly, it's a time to escape the chain of poverty. We get our land back on the Jubilee year. A lot of people talk about this today, that the gap between the rich and the poor is gonna, is gonna destroy a civilization, that you can't have you know, billions and billions of dollars to several major corporations. And then you, know, you have, you have a, a large middle class, but you also have a very poor class. Um, some are, would argue that it needs to be leveled out. And clearly the Jubilee year is trying to do that. It kind of levels out. All the people who acquired a lot of property, they got to give it back. Let's take a look at the robot directly because he is the most uh, utopian in his description. Robot was a uh, Provencal rabbi, Rabbi Levi ben uh, Gershon, Gershon, a uh, big philosopher, had some radical ideas about philosophy, but a very traditional commentary on the Torah. Tivta Torah Shtiyash Srora Sherebrikarkos Kolels Umuchtevis Cholamash. This lordship that people have over everyone else, because I'm a big landowner, plantation, right? It should be more spread out. Uh, it also, you'll help the poor people. And because they get to eat from your crops that year, they could go into your field and eat the crops. And that's why he told us to also, you should. Uh, forget the loans that that the end of the year, so that this notion that you're the big shot, you're, you have the sarara, you have authority from one person over the other, will go away. And uh, um, it, things become more equalized. On the fiftieth year, it's even an even greater idea that this lording over the others that we have. Um, it may affect other people and it will go away on this year. There won't be any new sarara, new authority and that one yields over the other. Everyone goes back to their family. No one has authority over anyone else. No one can lord over anyone else. It is, I would argue, a utopian kind of value. Does the Torah think you can eradicate poverty? Torah says in Devarim, he says, no, give charity and there won't be any poor people. Some sofer says, how won't there be any poor people? I, I believe he means like, all these words here. I think he's saying the following. 
we know that when you give charity, you're supposed to give it in a nice way. If you give $100 to someone, you say, you rotten beggar, I'm sick of you. Every day you're begging from me. Here, take this $100, just leave me alone. The Ramam says, you don't get the mitzvah of tzedakah. That's not the mitzvah of tzedakah. Mitzvah of tzedakah say, oh, you need money? Here's $100, don't worry about it. I got plenty of money, don't worry about it. I, I had the extra, I didn't need this. Someone just gave it to me. You take it, enjoy, don't worry about it. So you make them feel good. That's part of the whole thing. So, um, so he says that there won't be any poor people in your land. What does that mean? There won't be any people who feel bad because if you give in a good way, then no one will feel bad. So that's a cute interpretation. I'm not sure that, but but the question is: Does the Torah really believe we could eradicate poverty? Remember the war on war on poverty or the, the yeah. poverty czar, right? Somehow going to have a guy, a minister of uh, poverty, and he's going to er erase poverty. So th this verse seems to say, yeah, you won't have any poor people. No poor people anymore. So um, so the rabbis generally say that it depends. If we, if we do God's will, there won't be any poor people. If we don't do God's will, there will always be poor people. There's another verse also in, in, in Re'e, in, in the Devarian, that's, that's very close to this verse, and it says that that uh, there'll always be poor people. So you better open your hand because there'll always be poor people. And this verse says, open your hand so there won't be any poor people. What's the answer? If, if we really live in a high plane, we live in a utopian world where there will be no poor poverty. There is such a dream uh, in Judaism. Then we get to a very strange thing. What about death and murder? Could we ever eradicate death and murder, right? You always, every president, every mayor, every governor, they're always trying to the war on crime and the, 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 the murder rate is too high. We're going to bring it down. And, you know, you can bring it down a bit so that I and I hear. They just said, they said, you know, people like to say Giuliani brought down the crime because he, he prosecuted small crimes. They just did a study that shows the opposite, that if you don't prosecute small crimes, you, you bring down crime. Anyway, but so who knows how to eradicate uh, murder and things like that. We live certainly in a city. Thank God I experienced it as being very peaceful, but... Unfortunately, many people uh, have been uh, murdered here and things like that, shootings, a lot of terrible things uh, go on in many cities. So Baltimore recently, there was a terrible shooting. Someone was telling me they came from uh, another country, a war-torn country, came to America, they got shot in, uh, in the leg. But um, could we dream of a world where there wouldn't be murder or even murder by mistake? So <laughs> Torah says a funny thing. Says, you know, one day God will help you. will have a really big country when you have the regular country. You know, the regular Israel today, they have today, or to the Jordan or the Transjordan. So you can have three cities of refuge: three on the west bank of the Jordan River and three on the east bank of the Jordan River. But if God will expand your horizons, have a larger country, then they'll give you three more cities. So, so he says, three more cities. Why do you need three more cities? If God expands, when is God going to expand the horizon? So Rashi says, you keep all the mitzvahs I tell you today to love God and to go in his ways. I'll give you three more cities. Rashi says, nine altogether, three on this side, three on that side, and then three, and God enlarges our territory. When we take over Iraq and Iran and everything else, then he'll give us three more. I'm joking. I don't know what the eastern border of Israel general, we don't, Israel doesn't go that far. But in any event, so the Sefer Achino says, the time when the King Mashiach will come, we'll add three more. What? Mashiach is coming. The world is becoming into perfection. I thought utopianism. And you're adding three more cities in case someone kills someone by mistake. So let me get this straight. Mashiach came. Israel's expanded. Everybody's great. Everybody's worshiping God. There's one God in the whole world. And you need three more cities for all the people who killed people by mistake. What are you talking about? Says the Minchas Chinuch, commentary on the Sefer Chinuch, little Rabbi Babad from the 1800s, 1700s. He says, one day the land of Israel will spread out to the whole world. Mashiach will conquer the whole world. And the whole world will be considered Israel uh, with all the holiness. But you don't need more than three Yari Miklat. And then now the equation's a little better. If Israel expanded by another, you know, it tripled, Israel's very small. It's the side of Rhode Island. So now it'll be the size of New York City, New York State. 
get a triple. Okay. Um, and you still, you need th three more. He says, no, no, no. Israel's going to be the size of the whole world and you only need three more. All right, so now the, the math is a little better. There'll be some murder by mistake, but not much. But he says, um, you know, the Torah says it, because logically, he says, you really wouldn't need any cities of refuge in the end of days. There'll only be peace and truth and goodness in those days when, when the king we're all looking forward to, soon in our time. But there's Xerus that causes the Torah says, when you get the Mashiach, make three more cities. You don't need the cities, but just make them for refuge, in case anybody needs refuge. So, um, or that, you know, the Mashiach doesn't, the Mashiach's not born in the day. He's going to conquer Israel, Transjordan. Then he'll conquer some more things, I don't know, Lebanon, something. And then, before he really becomes the Mashiach, you'll need cities of refuge for people who kill by mistake. And then when the whole world accepts God, then um, you won't really need these cities, but they already have the cities, but you won't really need them. So that's an interesting suggestion. But the, the Milchaz Chinos realizes the paradox of a world that's perfect, perfect, supposedly a utopian world of Mashiach, and that there's still people killing people by mistake. Or maybe it's not so strange. Maybe we're not looking forward to utopian society, Looking forward to a very good society. Will somebody, a slamazel, still drop a knife and, 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 and use a blade that he shouldn't use and target practice and without a good target and somebody gets hit? And yeah, the slamazel will always be. So, so there could still be death by, by, by mistaken murder, even when the Mashiach comes. Maybe, or maybe not. Maybe once the Mashiach is really firm and affixed, there won't be any death like that. Let's look at the Ramam. What is that? How does the Ramam describe the days of the Mashiach? Is it utopian? It's not day. There won't be any famine. It's pretty good. There won't be any wars. Very utopian, right? Isaiah, the lamb will lie with the, with the lion. Lokin av, there won't be any jealousy, competition. Very, very utopian. Why? Because there'll be so much wealth. You don't have to be jealous. You're also a millionaire. You can get whatever you want. There's as many Kiwis and a few big houses, you can get as much as you want. The only thing people will be interested in is, is knowing God. And the, the, Israel will be very great sages and we'll know a lot of stuff, a lot of secrets, and we'll understand our creator, we'll understand God according to how a person can understand God. And it says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9, the land is filled with the knowledge of God like the water covers the sea. So that sounds pretty utopian. That's the Rambam in his magnum opus at the end of the book. The Rambam in the parish of Mishnayos, when he was younger, he wrote the commentary on the Mishnah in chapter 10 of Sanhedrin where it talks about the Mashiach, belief in Mashiach. So he says, the Mashiach will die. At a certain point, the Mashiach will die. He doesn't, by the way, he doesn't come back, but he just died. And he, his son will take over and his grandson as Hashem says. Um, and he will be strong until he, but until he establishes, you know, rule, rule of, of Torah in this world. And it'll be a long, very long time, it'll live a long time. Um, people will live a long life, like today, and longer. Why? Because you don't have any tzaras, you don't have any worries, you'll live longer. And it's not it wouldn't be strange if you could have a kingship that lasted, you know, thousands of years. Um, Etc. So, uh, but he says he will die. There's a Medrash that talks about this. Medrash Rabbah, Amr Rechina, every death in the world to come, no death, except for Gentiles. They will have death. They'll also live a long time, but they'll die. Rishuv and Levi says, well, we swallow loves the coming. Not the Jews, not the Gentiles. It calls them here idol worshippers. I think it just it's referring to the people who today are idol worshippers. In the end of days, they won't be idol worshippers anymore. But uh, there's still a debate. Will they live a long time? Will they, will they live forever? And after all, it says in Isaiah 25, 8, 
God will wipe off tears from all faces. And we say this at funerals, and we hope the, uh, that there won't be any death anymore. So my Avi Rabbi Chinyan, what, what does it mean? There will be, oh, from all faces, there won't be any death. That's all Jewish faces. He says, yeah, but what in verse in Isaiah 65 says, now ben Shaniyamus, a child will die at 100 years old. There'll be a young, young man will die at 100 years old in the end of days. So we see people will die. That supports Rabbi Chinyan. That maybe he's talking about a guy, a Gentile. So what Rabbi Shuvan Levi says, um, so they go on and on. The Medrash goes on. But um, there is a debate as to whether everyone will live long. According to this, everybody would agree that the Jews will live uh, forever. Um, but we already saw the Ramam doesn't agree with this. The Ramam does not take this vision of, this, of either opinion in that Medrash. He believes the Mashiach will die. Presumably, people who are not Mashiach will certainly die. Um, oh. and, and non Jews. Oh. So the Rambam oh. says, the Ramban says, Yigzer Arab Zal Misal Mashiach Valdere. The Ramban says in his Sharag Mu, when he talks about the Mashiach, he says it's terrible. The Rambam decreed death on the Mashiach on his whole generation. Because obviously, if Mashiach dies, everybody else dies. Really, really, you think Mashiach's going to die? You, uh, what kind of. So, I thought that's what proved that Yashki was in Mashiach and Bark, uh, uh, the other guy that was so popular. Uh, right. uh, Generally, we say, no, 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 wait, wait, let's not confuse. You're right. If Mashiach dies before he does his mission, he's not the Mashiach. Even if he did half the mission of being Mashiach, he the Jewish do everything, guy. he's not the Mashiach. However, if he does all the jobs, he brings the, 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 the Jews to Israel. He builds the temple. He makes everyone worship God in the whole world. And then he dies. That's the Ramah would say. That's fine. Well, who was the guy that, it was Jewish guy that he had a lot of followers, even uh, Rabbi Akiva, uh, very famous. Uh, Bar, Bar Kofa. Once he Bar was Kofa. dead. Yeah. Once he was dead, it was over. Right. Once he was dead, it was over. Um, right. The only Mashiach who ever died and people said it wasn't over was Shabtai Tzvi and Lubav Trev. But other than that, died no one has ever claimed that someone who died, uh, that a Jewish uh, person who died, would be Mashiach after he's dead. Um, what does Hillel <laughs> say? Himself, the Rambam would say the Mashiach himself will die and he won't come back. He's because the according to the Rambam, the real world to come is in the next world of souls. Uh, you got to have the real world in this world. So the Rambam is more of a utopian because the Rambam believes that the the you have to have a perfect world in this world where there's no death in this world. Yeah. He's, waiting, he's looking forward to utopian era. The Rambam says, no, in this world, there'll never be utopian. There'll be, uh, th there will be death. Uh, after a long time, there won't be any illness. Everyone will live a really long time. We're getting close to that kind of thing where many people live to 80, 90, 100 years old. Um, and it's getting to be you know, many thousands, tens of thousands of people uh, live that way, hopefully more and more. Um, but there will be death. The Ramban does not believe in absolute utopia. Ramban, now going back to Ramban, in this week's parsha, he says, says Israel al since the land of Israel is the most perfect, Tishbos Raz Minhaga, the the terrible nature that has developed into what we today call nature will go away. And it'll go back to the original nature, which was put there at the time of creation. And what's that? Uh, when when Mashiach comes, the animals, the wild animals will not will not uh, uh, kill their prey. A lion will not cure, kill a uh, zebra because there'll be peace in the world and the evil of the animals and all the different creatures which were originally de designed to be peaceful loving, it will go back to their original way. And that's in the days of Chizkiah, they tried to make, they tried to go back to that world, but it didn't work out. Um, so the, the Ramban is, a, a, is an utopian. He believes that you can get to a place where there'll be no violence, and even the even the lion wouldn't be violent. He would lose his violent nature, go back to his original nature, which was not supposed to be violent. Um, as it, uh, and again, he would uh, he would promote this verse in Isaiah that says that one day God will wipe off tears from every uh, face. Um, so, so that's uh, that's the story. Um, it's Isaiah 
chapter 25, verse 8. So that verse is certainly very utopian. And finally, I think um, the question of utopianism, not so much in the world to come, but really in this world right here, comes down to this Mishnah here. The Mishnah says in Pergevos that if someone says, what's mine is yours, you can have anything I have. I have some silver over here. You can have the whole thing. But what's, and what's yours is also yours. I don't want any of your silver. You can keep it. That's pious. One who says it's mine and mine and, mine, and what's mine is mine. Oh, what's yours is mine and what's mine is mine. That's wicked. Now, <laughs> so in order, if we're really pious, right? If we really want to be, you know, beyond the letter of the law. Is that what we're expected to be? Is that kind of a utopian idea that I should say that anybody can take anything you want? You want to steal my car? It's not steal. You can take my car. Take it. What? You want my computer? Take my computer. We can't do it. Take my thousand dollars. I don't own anything. It's like the Jubilee year, right? You, do you need the sabbatical year to, to remind you, hello, doesn't belong to you? Right? So is this just talking about some commentary say, it's talking about charity. In other words, my car is my car. What's My car is not your car. No one is expected, except for a fool, to say that my car is your car. No, my car is my car. My money in my bank is my bank. However, if you need charity, I should look at it as like, whatever's mine is yours. What, you need to go to college? I got, I got some extra money. I can give it to you. I'll, I'll, I'll manage. I have to help you. So that would be, you know, maybe that's what they're saying on the level of charity. You should say, well, it's, it's not, well, I have all my money. Why should you have my money? Well, if you have enough extra, give the other guy, you give it to him. Um, now, if you need it for your own children, that's a different story. But um, so it's interesting, you know, if, do we really take this view? Is, is, are, are, we, are we communists? I'm my rabbi, Rabbi Maidan talked about this. He says, oh, look, we believe in private property, right? It says, do not steal. Why can't you steal? After all, you think that belongs to you, right? Guy walks over to you, hits, hits you over the head, takes you a while. So you say, look, after all, love your neighbor as yourself. It's, why should it be my wallet? Let it be his wallet. We don't say that. So generally speaking, it's not a utopian uh, law. The Torah is not a utopian law. This Mishnah suggests maybe something kind of utopian at, at a pious level, the chassid. Don't forget, the chassid is not, the Mishnah is not saying everyone should say what's mine is yours and what's yours is yours. No, it's saying most people are just bainerning. We're normal people. This is the pious, the chassid. The chassid is someone who goes beyond the law. Maybe the idea is that to go beyond the law you have to take this position. So, um, you know, so I, I think it's worth thinking about, uh, you know, does the Torah have this sort of communist kind of an idea that, you know, there's no private property. You know, whose bicycle is my bicycle? It's everybody's, what, I'll put it on the front. Whoever wants to take it, you need a ride. You, 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 the keys are in the car. You want to take it, you take it, you give it back. You don't give it back. So is, is the mission talking at that level? Or just saying, look, you should look at your things not just in the Jubilee year and the sabbatical, you should always look at your thing as if, look, God gave it to me. And right now I need to share it with this guy who's down on his luck. Um, and it's not, it's not like I'm doing a big favor. It's not mine. It's not, so, so which one is it? Um, so we had a discussion about, you know, is this sabbatical year about that? Or is it just about the world belongs to God? Is it about some theological thing? Or is the sabbatical year more about um, specifically regarding um, the idea that rich and poor should be equalized and sort of almost like a communist kind of a thing. Um, will poverty be, ever be eradicated? You know, in order to suggest that when we're truly righteous, maybe it will be. Um, some sober suggested, but just with your attitude, you can er eradicate poverty, meaning the feeling of being poor could be eradicated by just being a nice person. Um, but there are people starving to death, millions and millions and millions. Uh, I mean, and there are people with hundreds of billions of dollars, and it's just like, uh, oh, we really don't live in utopian society, right? It's it's not clear that if you took all the money and chopped it up and gave it to everyone, there would still be enough. It could be that you know there would still be poor people, but um, but yeah, presumably uh, it could be. Uh, yeah, again, the Republican argument is that you know you know. You don't want to have a Walmart, so then fine. Then you know, firstly, you know, 
you may not have a store to go to and uh, you don't have a job at your corner that you can get. And you know, you know, there's rich people do, do create jobs, right? So when someone's you know, unemployed, I look through the Rolodex of the shul, who owns a company in the shul and can employ someone, right? If there's no one in the shul who's an employer, then when someone's unemployed, and got nobody to send them to. Because so you say, well, why is he so rich? You don't let him be so rich. The takeaway is my let's let's tax him 70%. So that's very nice, but then when I need uh, money for the poor person, who's gonna give it? Everyone's equal, right? So it, it's it's an interesting question. So then we talked about whether there could be um, murder murder by mistake, or any murder, but certainly murder by mistake in an ideal world, possibly. Uh, we talked about whether there'd be death in an ideal world, and the Ram says yes. yes. Um, and, and then we talked about, um, you know, do we really believe that what's mine is yours and what's yours is yours as well? Is that a general principle or not? And so now, to what extent is this sabbatical year philosophy a general philosophy or is it just, you know, an occasional philosophy or one to be applied when, when, when it's our time to give charity? All right, so, uh, so I don't have one answer. I think they're different different views, some like the, the Rambam saying, we're not totally utopians, we're pretty realistic. Uh, we have others like Ramban who believe that we one day will enter a totally utopian kind of a world in which uh, everything, including death itself, uh, will be eradicated and nature itself will change. All right, so that's our lesson for tonight. At this point, I will take comments or questions. Thank you so much.